So let me introduce you to a heroine. Her name was Dorothy Gwynedd Darnell, and she lived from 1876 to 1953. It's thanks to this remarkable woman that we can today visit the Jane Austen Museum in Chawton. Now, she achieved this in a time of war. Dunkirk was being evacuated as she formed the Jane Austen Society. Rationing was in force. Death and disaster were in the news every day as World War II was raging. And yet Dorothy could look positively to the future. She could think about the things that were important to English culture and she could plan ahead. What an inspiration in our own very difficult COVID times, Dorothy's positivity and vision are. Now, Dorothy was born in Edinburgh. She was the daughter of a clergyman. She was a very gifted artist and she trained under Sir William Nicholson. And she exhibited her paintings on several different occasions at the Royal Academy. She moved to Kensington and she specialised in portrait painting. And this is a portrait that she painted of a woman called Emily Damon, who was an English musician and a foundation scholar of the Royal Society of Music, sorry, Royal College of Music. So I think another interesting, intelligent and groundbreaking woman. Her other portrait, is called Study of a Female Figure. It's an historical painting, but I think when you look at this, you get a sense of why Dorothy liked Jane Austen. There's a quietness to the painting, this domestic detail, and this very careful study of a woman. So you could sort of see that, you know, yes, the woman who painted this is a woman who was intelligent and liked Jane Austen. Thanks. Now, Dorothy had long loved the novels of Jane Austen. Her parents had moved down from Scotland to Portsea, and as she drove from London to visit her parents regularly, her route took her through the village of Chawton. Once stuck there in a traffic problem, she asked an AA guide which was the house that had once been lived in by Jane Austen, and he replied very irritably that Jane Austen's house was the plague of his life. So her curiosity was aroused. In the late 1930s, Dorothy was out walking in Chawton and she found an old fire grate that had been ripped out of Chawton Cottage because a new gas fire was being installed there. The grate was actually lying in a bed of nettles and Dorothy rescued it. She then wondered what to do with this great chunk of metal that she had oh, rescued. And she was advised to contact a local historian, a man called Mr. Curtis, an Alton man who was actually great grandson of Jane Austen's own apothecary. And he curated a local history museum. And Mr. Curtis said he would provide house space for the great until Dorothy worked out what she wanted to do with it. Now, Dorothy began to think and to consider the very sad state of Jane Austen's former home. The cottage had originally been built in the 17th century. It was once home to a farmer, and then it became the New Inn, so it was actually a pub from 1781 to 1787. Evidently, two murders took place there during that time. Its owner was Edward Austen Knight, obviously descendant of Jane's brother, and he let it to a man called Bailiff Bridger Seward, who worked for him, uh, so he was handy for the whole Chawton estate. In 1809, the cottage became Jane's home. After she died, her mother and sister lived on there. Mrs. Austen died in 1827 and Cassandra in 1845. After that, the cottage was divided into smaller apartments for workers on the Chawton estate, so it was sort of subdivided. At the start of the 20th century, part of it, in what is actually now the drawing room, became a working men's club. So people were wandering in and out of the house that was subdivided. The place really had become something of a mess. Mrs. Austen's garden was a complete mess. The window at some stage was bricked up, making what is a rather ordinary looking cottage look a little bit lopsided and odd. When he wrote his biography of his Aunt Jane, James Edward Austen Lee stated, there is nothing in it either beautiful or romantic, nothing to associate it with the memory of the immortal Jane. 
So Dorothy could see quite rightly that the cottage was falling into such disrepair that it would at some stage be pulled down and she felt very strongly that this must not happen. The pond was still there at that time, just along the road. Jane Austen once wrote, our pond is brimful and our roads are dirty. So, uh, you know, things were, you know, if the pond flooded badly, the house could be damaged. It was really falling into quite a bad state of disrepair. Now, Dorothy was very aware that others, other writers' homes had recently been saved for the nation. The Bronte Society in the UK was formed in 1893, and in 1928, the Bronte Parsonage Museum was opened to the public, and this shows the opening of that museum. The Dickens Fellowship was formed in 1902, and Dickens's former home at 48 Doughty Street was opened in 1925. So, Fairly in fairly recent times, two new societies have been formed with the aim of saving the home of that particular author, or in the case of the Brontes, more than one. Abbotsford, uh, Sir Walter Scott's adored home, was opened to Scott fans in the year 1833, so it was really early as a museum. And there was also a literary society for Sir Walter Scott. I don't think one exists anymore. And of course, we know that Jane Austen herself had greatly enjoyed the novels and the poems of Sir Walter Scott. So had she lived and had the opportunity, would Jane Austen ever have gone to Abbotsford as a tourist, as Charlotte Bronte once did? So why was there no society for Jane Austen, Dorothy wondered? Well, since there was this terrible lack, she herself would have had to do something about it. She would establish a Jane Austen Society with the aim of raising funds to save the cottage. Some people told her that doing such a thing was simply not possible or it was irrelevant, she was told. And she was very firmly told that her foolish plan should be postponed indefinitely. But Dorothy ploughed on, and on the 29th of May, 1940, in the midst of that Dunkirk evacuation, Dorothy held the first meeting of the Jane Austen Society. Mr William Hugh Curtis, the man who was still busy housing the great, became the chairman. Dorothy served as secretary, and uh, she roped in Elizabeth Jenkins, who of course wrote the uh, uh, first scholarly biography of Jane Austen. And uh, so she shared the role of secretary with Elizabeth Jenkins for some time in the early years of the society. She also roped in her sister Alice Beatrix Darnell, who lived from 1873 to 1970, so a very good age. So these three women were all unmarried, modest, there are almost no other photographs of them, and I certainly looked. They were very self-effacing, and they seemed to have preferred anonymity. Dorothy and Beatrix, or Alice was always known as Beatrix, were very devoted sisters, and perhaps they felt a connection to Jane and her sister Cassandra because of that. Now, Beatrix was not a huge Jane Austen fan, but if her sister needed her, then she would be roped in and she became the first treasurer of the society. Probably through Mr Curtis, they secured the agreement of Mr Edward Knight, then of course owner of Chawton Cottage, that he would sell the property to them for £3,000. Now, that's about £110,000 in today's money. They began their fundraising campaign, and these women made tireless efforts to track down items that had once been in the cottage. Elizabeth Jenkins and Dorothy wrote to as many Austin descendants as they could find. They studied auction room catalogues to see what might be coming up for sale that they could get for the cottage. And Dorothy also gathered up oral history reports about the Austins from people in the village. She was aware that when elderly locals died, their stories would die with them, and she wanted to see what information she could get. Dorothy was absolutely tenacious in all of this. 
She also got the guidance of uh, the first uh, great Jane Austen editor, R.W. Chapman, and of Mary Lassells, who wrote the first scholarly critical book about Jane Austen. Her book, Jane Austen and Her Art, came out in 1939, so that was a very recent publication when Dorothy was starting her efforts. Mary was another remarkable woman, a lecturer at Somerville College in Oxford, and she and R. W. Chapman both agreed that they would be trustees of the newly formed Jane Austen Memorial Trust. Chapman had just edited the six novels with what is now being recognised as huge assistance from his wife Catherine. So these were prestigious people for Dorothy to get on board, and she wanted more of them. It was something of a PR triumph for her when she got the current Duke of Wellington, Gerald Lord Wellesley, seventh Duke of Wellington, to serve as president of the society. His name, of course, would help them achieve all the desired publicity. He stayed on as president of the trust for 15 years, retiring at the age of 80. And if you wanted to join this new society, by the way, you had to pay half a crown for your annual subscription. Then suddenly, Dorothy's efforts of getting advertisements into the paper about this new society and writing articles in local newspapers and magazines suddenly produced a really wonderful offer of help. Mr. Thomas Edward Carpenter, whose son Philip had been tragically killed at Trasimene in 1944 during the war, saw Dorothy's requests for help in the newspaper and he decided to purchase the cottage and give it to a newly formed Jane Austen Memorial Trust. So you can see the sign for his son Philip, and he, because Philip had loved the novels of Jane Austen, so Mr Carpenter and his wife Catherine felt that the house would be a wonderful memorial for their dead son. So this meant that because he paid the money for the house, the fundraising done by Dorothy and her remarkable team could now all be spent on items that would go inside the cottage or any repairs that needed to be done. Mr Carpenter seemed very determined to keep the house and the society separate. He didn't hand the house over to the society, he handed it to this memorial trust that got formed. So maybe he wanted to see how the new society performed before trusting it with the care of the house. And the two things, the society and the memorial trust, actually only merged after Mr Carpenter's death. So the next picture shows us these four, four people and there's Dorothy in her lovely flattering outfit that she's wearing there. And Mr. Carpenter is the person on the far side. We don't know who the other two in the picture are. And so in 1949, thanks to Dorothy, the saved house was opened to the public. Today, in normal times, that house gets 40,000 visitors per year. And today we have this plaque uh, the plaque on the building telling us the story. Now, Dorothy's name is very quietly there at the bottom of the plaque. She had no title, unlike Lieutenant and Duke and uh, you know all these other people who have titles, JP, etc., etc. She has no titles like the other names do. She had no great connections, but I think this modest woman, Dorothy Darnell, had done something absolutely wonderful, benefiting all of us who love the novel of Jane Austen. So that old grate, you can see it there, is now of course back in situ in the dining room. And uh, in the anniversary of Jane Austen's death, the 200 years since she died, the house held a special um, sort of exhibition thing called 41 Objects, because Jane Austen was 41 when she died, they chose 41 objects that had some interesting story to tell about her life. Uh, that was in 2017. And the Chawton Museum featured the grate as one of the important 41 objects. The first trustees of the new Jane Austen Memorial Trust formed to care for the house were R. W. Chapman, Mary Lassells, Mr. William Curtis, Mr. Thomas Carpenter, and our heroine, Dorothy Darnell. So you saw before the opening of the cottage uh, with Dorothy and Mr. Carpenter there. Now, the Jane Austen Society, celebrating its 80th birthday this year, has continued to grow and flourish. 
From very early on, it published an annual report, which has changed greatly over the years. You can see some of the early ones, and you can see how they have changed and improved, much like our own wonderful JAZA reports. And of course, these reports have benefited many through their scholarly articles. The first annual report came out in 1950, and the, the reports since then have provided archival investigations, old photographs, and much sharing of knowledge and history. I think that literary societies expand ideas and bring together those with common interests. And, of course, they also encourage people to engage in a bit of detective work sometimes, as some of our own JAZA members have found when starting off with writing books. Uh, so these annual reports of the Jane Austen Society have just recently all gone online, so anybody who wants to use them can do so. And just this year, the Society launched an essay prize, so they're encouraging people to write about Jane Austen. So the Society continues to grow and expand. AGMs have been held in the grounds of Chawton Great House. I attended one in the 1980s and Lord David Cecil was there. I think he was actually president at the time. I, I was amazed. I was actually looking at a real live lord. You know, lords had only existed in novels for me before that. And I was far too scared to go and speak to him. But uh, uh, they had cucumber sandwiches on the lawn and it was all very English and absolutely delightful. But that was all they used to do, was one event a year. And as time went on, the society was slightly shamed by its new American equivalent into actually doing a little bit more in the way of events. Now there are branches all over the UK with very active programs indeed. So the Jane Austen Memorial Trust ran the cottage until 2014. It's now run by the Jane Austen's House Museum as a registered charity. Mr. Carpenter was actively involved as chairman of the trust. He purchased more items for the house, such as Jane Austen's shawl, which is on display there, and he seems to have made running Jane Austen's house something of a family business. In 1961, the three trustees of the cottage were all carpenters. Mr. Carpenter continued all this work for the house until he died in 1969. He paid for repairs, including the strengthening of roof beams and the eradication of pests. And when one member of staff had an accident, he arranged for all of her medical care. Now, this is Tom Carpenter, who's the grandson of that Mr. Carpenter. And for many years, he was curator at the Jane Austen House. So, so much has been gained and achieved because of Dorothy Darnell. Uh, I have heard that just recently there was, quote, an exciting cache of documents found relating to the original pur purchase of the cottage. So we should learn more about that in the next Jane Austen Society UK report. Now, this is a recent novel by Natalie Jenner called The Jane Austen Society. It is a very enjoyable read, but it does make up a completely different scenario for the formation of the society and the saving of the cottage. It brings in an American film star, an unhappy gay farmer, a frustrated archivist, and various other enjoyable characters. And it does acknowledge in an epilogue that the whole story is entirely made up. But I fear that many people don't bother to read epilogues. And will this novel have fixed in people's minds that that is what really happened? I'd actually love someone to write a fabulous novel about the true heroine of this story who made all of it happen. So let's turn now to writers' house museums and why there should be a need to save them. Why do we visit such places? What should be put out on display in them? And how should items be displayed? This is a picture of Sir Walter Scott's wonderful study in Abbotsford. Now, some writers virtually create their own museums for posterity. Sir Walter Scott's self-dramatization gave us Abbotsford. He very self-consciously collected and displayed all sorts of items and furniture because he was so famous in his lifetime, he knew his house would become a museum. If you visit Abbotsford, it's as if Sir Walter has just popped out to do a bit of fishing in the Tweed River. His clothes, his pens, his furniture, the historical items he collected, such as Rob Roy's dagger, are all still there where he placed them. 
Now, Scott's fame has, of course, somewhat faded today, and there have actually been visitors turning up at Abbotsford asking where on earth all the Antarctic stuff has been hidden, <laughs> because they've got the wrong Scott. But nobody had to go to any trouble to collect Sir Walter's things or wonder where to put them in the house once they had them. This next picture is of Hilltop Farm, Beatrix Potter's home. She did the same. Now, in her last years, she did much of her living in another house that she owned in the Lake District. And so Hilltop Farm was sort of set out as if it was a museum. And she left incredibly strict instructions that furniture was not to be moved to other rooms, and this was where things were, and that's how they had to stay. And the same happened with the next picture, which is Sir Horace Walpole's Strawberry Hill, another example of a house where the author was so famous in his lifetime, although not very much today, and uh, it, everything was kept exactly as Walpole wanted it to be. Uh, it has recently been fabulously renovated, although who reads Sir Horace Walpole's novels today? Not very many people. Now, other writers enjoy such fame in their lifetimes that most things associated with their lives are saved by family and friends. And when they die, their homes are almost immediately turned into museums. And Rudyard Kipling's wonderful Batemans, one of my favorite literary houses in the whole world, is an example of this. His books are on the shelves where he placed them. His traveling trunk is sitting there ready for his next holiday. Everything is pretty much as Kipling left it because his wife lived on in the house after he died, but after that it became a museum. And the next picture shows Longfellow's study in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's packed with his possessions all in exactly the right place. Now, I don't think many people read Longfellow much now, Hiawatha, Tales of a Wayside Inn, but his house is still fascinating from an historical point of view, even if you don't know Longfellow's writings. Others, other writers' house museums emerge many years after the death of the author, and that, of course, is the case with Jane Austen's home. When this happens, there has to be refabricating, reassembling, and many curatorial decisions have to be made. Now, if more than one home exists associated with an author, which one should be turned into a museum? Had this Steventon birthplace survived, would Dorothy have focused more on saving that or on Chawton Cottage? Which house is the more important? The house she lived in the longest or the house where she did most of her published writing? It's an interesting thing to think about. You know, had there only been enough money to save one, which one should have been saved? This is Mark Twain's birthplace. Now, should a writer's house museum be a birthplace, like this one of Mark Twain's, or should it be a house where an author grew up, like Georges Sand's lovely house at Noan in France, or should it be the house where they wrote their great works, like Louisa May Alcott's Orchard House, or should it be the house in which they died, like Ibsen's home in Oslo? Should the home of a wife be a literary museum? How far do you go with connections? Anne Hathaway, Shakespeare's wife, her house is a museum. Or should a writer's house be the house described, or should a museum be a house described in the writer's fiction, like Green Gables? Should a writer be homed elsewhere? Robbie Burns's chair is on display in a tavern, not in one of his houses. And Thomas Hardy's study, which you can see in this picture, has actually been totally moved out of his house into a museum in Dorchester, even though the house in which the study was originally is still standing only a couple of miles away. So it's interesting to think about what ought to be saved. And, you know, if you've only got so much money and one house is falling down and, and another one which has fed, also fairly good claims is falling down, which one gets saved for the nation? And then next is the category of literary museums that replicate scenes from books. Now, James Joyce set the opening of Ulysses in the Martello Tower at Sandy Cove near Dublin. And the museum there, which is a fabulous place to visit, has replicated the opening of Ulysses. So you actually feel you are walking into his novel when you visit it. 
and Green Gables has Anne's bedroom with Anne's dress with those famous puff sleeves hanging there ready for her to put on. Well this is a room that a fictional girl is supposed to have lived in but the girl never existed and the room certainly never looked anything like that. So how far should museums go in recreating rooms from novels? So should the Chawton drawing room, for example, perhaps be replicated as the drawing room in the Dashwoods cottage? What is it that we want when we go to these houses? With any writer's house museum, we need to ask which rooms should be opened to the public. Now, Jane Austen's Chawton Kitchen has only recently been opened to visitors, and it has proved very popular. Children seem to enjoy making things in there and getting a sense of what a kitchen was like in that era. In fact, kitchens seem to be terribly in at the moment. But then many of the male writers who we have museums for probably never went anywhere near the kitchens in their homes, so should the kitchen in that case be put on display? The Wordsworth kitchen in his birthplace at Cockermouth is absolutely fabulous. And it has become an important part of the teachings of that museum. They actually make food in there for the period using only the equipment of that era. Uh, and children absolutely adore the kitchen in Wordsworth's house. But uh, I don't think Wordsworth ever did any cooking in there. He was, he was probably too young and anyway boys didn't do cooking in that era um, of his class in society. This is Jane Austen's bedroom of course at Chawton. So what is the purpose of a museum such as Chawton Cottage? Should it present a biography of Jane Austen, telling us her life story? Is that what we should be getting when we go to Chawton? Or should the museum be attempting an evaluation of her works and the impact they have made? I was asking my husband about this, and he's not into life stories of authors. He thinks they're irrelevant to enjoying a book. It's an argument we have, but anyway. Um, and he said, oh, I think that Chawton should have, he said, she wrote six novels, didn't she? And I glared at him. <laughs> yes, she did write six, Ian. <laughs> and he said, I think what the museum ought to be doing is putting aside one room for each of the six novels and trying to explain the novel in that room and encouraging people to go away and read that novel. And I said, but it's her home. It's to do with her life. He said, no, no, people aren't interested. They don't need to know about her life. But, you know, what should a museum like Chawton be doing? Should a museum simply be there to preserve the physical building and curate the items that are on display? Should the museum promote that writer's reputation and encourage people to go away and read the works? There's the shop at Chawton. Should it sell souvenirs and postcards and make more money so that more objects can be bought when they come up for sale? So should the Jane Austen House Museum be there just because it's part of England's cultural heritage? But then who decides what is vital national heritage? Now for somebody that might be a football stadium rather than a writer's house museum. It's a very personal and individual thing. And then, of course, decisions have to be made about which items it is suitable to display in a museum. This is Charlotte Bronte's corset, and it is not put out on display for visitors at Haworth to admire or ogle or whatever the case might be. Agatha Christie's portable mahogany toilet seat is there for visitors to look at at Greenway, her Devon home. Does peeping into her cloakroom to see the seat she sat on when she needed to do things violate social decorum? How far should we be going with what we put on display? Now the loose seat might tell us something about the many trips she took to Iraq with her archaeologist husband Max Mallowan because the loose seat went with her on all of those trips. But is displaying such an item as the toilet seat or the corset outside the proper confines of what parts of an author's life ought to be shown to the public. How much intimacy do we want with a writer when we visit his or her home? Do we need to see a plaster cast of Robbie Burns's skull? Do we need to see the death mask of Jonathan Swift? People are not really looking their best when they die, so putting a death mask on display, is it, is it too much? Do we need, when we visit Dylan Thomas's house, to see the crutches that belong to his mother or a pair of Hans Christian Andersen's dentures? 
So if a pair of Jane Austen's undies suddenly came to light, should they be purchased and put on display at Chawton? Where does one draw the line when it comes to these things in museums? Now this next picture is a thoroughly gruesome one. In Petrarch's home in the town of Aqua Petrarca in northern Italy, which I think is the only town in the world to have been named after an author, there is on display a really grotesque mummified cat. Petrarch's home is probably the oldest writer's house extant in the world, and the cat is a hoax. People liked the idea of a writer having a cat, you know, comforting thing there to, you know, solace you in your lonely job of writing your poems. And in 1635, a painting was done showing Petrarch in his study with a cat by his side. Now, this was nearly 300 years after Petrarch died. The owner of the house at that time wanted to attract more visitors, so he put this mummified cat on display and he stated categorically that this was Petrarch's cat. For a long time, the cat was regarded as genuinely the one that had belonged to the poet. Now, Petrarch's actual bodily remains have been dug up, dismembered and moved on quite a few occasions. So clearly where his skeleton lies has mattered to people over the centuries, and there are still arguments raging today between Ravenna and Florence as to where Dante's remains ought to be. And I think the mummified cat can be seen as a sort of sardonic joke at the expense of a cultural desire to possess or gaze at material traces of a famous author. Lord Byron went to see this cat. He and other literary tourists saw the cat as evidence of Petrarch's material life, a symbol of his domesticity, and as also providing a physical object that could connect him with a writer who had died. So Byron was very happy looking at the cat because he felt it gave him a greater connection with Petrarch. So how far does one go in museums with these sorts of objects that are put on display? This is the Chawton dining room, of course. So when the Jane Austen house was finally acquired as a potential museum, many decisions had to be made. It was changed once they got the house, inside and out. Some possessions were lost or scattered forever, and there were no photographs or paintings to show how the house had once looked and been furnished. So today we can see some items belonging to the Austens, such as the Wedgwood china on display there in the dining room, which we know Jane Austen helped her brother choose, or the, the Heppel White bookcase filled with wonderful first editions. And I always think, how's the security system in this place when I visit? I'm always so tempted. There's Jane Austen's music books, which of course recently travelled to Australia. There are pieces of her jewellery, there's the patchwork quilt that she made with her mother and sister, and there's the tiny table on which she wrote. So the jewellery, there of course are the wonderful topaz crosses, but there's also a turquoise bracelet and there's the turquoise ring, which is one of the most recent items in the museum. And that's the ring there, and some of us of course have replicas on our fingers. So I'm sure you all know the story of the ring. It was purchased by Kelly Clarkson, a very popular singer. Uh, she wanted to take it with her to America. The British government suddenly said, oh no, it's an item of cultural importance. It shouldn't leave the country. Kelly said she would sell it back if for the amount she had paid for it, if you know somebody could raise that, that money. And eventually after great fundraising efforts, the museum was able to buy the ring back from Kelly. And it of course is there in the museum today. So it is one of the newest items. And so of course they've had to make room for, you know, where do you best display it? It's hugely valuable. I think they had to pay 130,000 pounds for it. I've forgotten the exact figure. And so there's got to be security for the ring as well. Now, one item that the Chawton Museum does not have is Jane Austen's portable writing slope. This is in the British Library on loan from Joan Austen Lee, one of the descendants, and her family. And it can be admired in the fabulous treasures exhibition that you can go to in London. What we do have in Chawton Cottage is the famous little table. And I think it's really interesting that the writing desk has never attracted the adoration and veneration 
that have been centred around that humble little table. Now, after Jane Austen's death, Cassandra gave that table to a male servant who had worked for her. It eventually made its way back into the museum. And we all know the story of Jane Austen writing on her little sheets of paper, the squeaky door covering up the papers, etc. But the chances are that she actually did far more of her writing on the writing slope that she owned. It's a portable desk, and it is the true paraphernalia of her literary genius. So why do we not love the writing slope as much? Is it because we're viewing it outside of her home? We're in a cold museum space in the British Library. It's just one of many different objects on display. Do we want to picture the writer working at home in her own domestic space? And is that why the table has attracted so much more attention? Charlotte Bronte's writing slope is on display at Haworth, one of the most important objects in the house. But Jane Austen's is not on display at Chawton. And is that why there has been a comparative lack of interest in the really important object that the writing slope is? Whereas the little table appears in virtually every illustrated book you ever come across, there'll be a picture of that writing table. Claire Tomalin has said of the table that, quote, back in its old home, it speaks to every visitor of the modesty of genius. So it's really interesting to think she probably did do more writing. She certainly took the writing slope with her whenever she was staying with her brother or away, and that's where she did her writing. But it's the little table that has been the all-important object. So what is it that draws us to Chawton? not just once, but many, many, many times. Virginia Woolf claimed that writers have a special capacity for imprinting themselves on things. In her essay, Great Men's Houses, she stated, it would seem to be a fact that writers stamp themselves upon their possessions more indelibly than other people, making the table, the chair, the curtain, the carpet into their own image. Julian Barnes, in his wonderful book, Flaubert's Parrot, has his narrator ask, why does the writing make us chase the writer? Why can't we leave well alone? So why do we want to follow the writer into their home? This is Daphne du Maurier's desk. Can we actually learn anything from gazing at Daphne du Maurier's desk or on Emily Dickinson's white dress or Agatha Christie's loo seat? Should a writer's house museum be there in the hopes that maybe it will inspire other writers? Now, Matthew Arnold only needed to imagine Howarth Parsonage to be inspired to write a poem about Charlotte's grave, and he got all the details wrong because he'd never actually seen the grave. And this is Dove Cottage. Seamus Heaney visited Dove Cottage and wrote a poem about Dorothy Wordsworth's coal scuttle as a result of the visit. So, you know, is that another purpose of a writer's house museum, that maybe it will inspire more great writing? A writer's house museum is dedicated to displaying something that isn't there, the author. Once they were there, but they have died and they have gone. So do we visit that house because we want to assert that writer's ongoing existence? Are we seeking a personal encounter with that author by picturing them in their own domestic space? I think we have a need to find the author at home, even if that author is dead, because such a museum keeps that author's life in perpetual resurrection. It gives us an avenue into the past and into that life. So a visit to Chawton gives us as close as we are ever going to get to a personal encounter with Jane Austen. When we go to such a place, are we visiting the dead? Are we seeking an intimacy that that author would not have wanted anyway? We know that Jane Austen guarded her privacy. She sat there in Chawton and she wrote her books anonymously and she sent them out into the world to be published. So she is now distant from us through time, through place, and through her death. Would she have wanted people like me to try and build a closer relationship with her just because I adore her books? Am I trying to turn Jane Austen into a kindred spirit by entering what was once her home with no invitation from her when she might never have wanted me to visit it when she was alive? 
So is it another form of fiction that we enter and experience a domestic space that she once inhabited, imagining we are guests of that author? And I think many of us visit Chawton thinking we have such a special relationship with Jane Austen, we're really appreciating it more than all these other hordes of tourists are doing. And it's that sort of intimate connection that we want when we visit these homes, particularly Jane Austen's. And what is the future of museums such as Chawton? Before COVID, they were booming. TV adaptations, social media, documentary films, and all sorts of other things have contributed to visitor numbers. This is a museum for George Burrow. Now, some literary museums closed down. There was this one once for George Burrow in Norfolk that had to be shut down because of a total lack of public interest. Anyone here read any George Borrow recently? No, neither have I. A Jerome K. Jerome Museum also had to be shut down fairly recently. And this museum is Sunnyside in America. It was the home of Washington Irving. Washington Irving was once so phenomenally popular, everyone read his books. And one 19th century commentator remarked that as long as people loved good literature, they would hurry to Sunnyside to see where he wrote his books. But today, people go to Sunnyside because of its stunning location on the banks of the Hudson River and because of the very unusual architecture of the house, rather than because of their love of Rip Van Winkle or the legend of Sleepy Hollow. Now, COVID has sadly meant that many such museums are in deep financial trouble. Chawton had to make a recent appeal for funds and was delighted at the number of donations that came flooding in from Romania, from Mexico, from Japan. They came in from all over the world. They easily met their target and they had money to spare as a result of that appeal. Now, the museum has just recently reopened. It's permitting 12 visitors in at a time. Uh, they're trying to let visitors sort of have a more intimate experience than they were able to do when there were bigger numbers coming through the door. Uh, they've got some nice music playing through, throughout the house, uh, and they're trying to make it a very special visit for those who do turn up. But they certainly won't be charging less for such a visit, and they might even be charging more, just so that they can keep going. Dove Cottage, another utterly wonderful uh, literary museum, has had a particularly bad run of, of luck. Um, they were closed for well over a year because they were gearing up for the big Wordsworth 250th anniversary earlier this year, it was in April. So they were so looking forward to reopening because they had had no money coming in throughout the whole of the renovations and with the cost of the building, a lot of money had been going out. Just as they were about to reopen and they had wonderful events planned for the 250th birthday, COVID struck and of course they had to remain closed. The Dickens Museum and Howarth Parsonage and Dove Cottage have all had to make recent pleas to the public and the government for emergency funding, just so that they can keep going. Each such museum will have to consider how to keep up to date, how to cope with social media. Now these days, visitors to museums can write what they like on social media, say, terrible place, food was dreadful in the cafe, hated it, so bored. Uh, and these comments, of course, influence other visitors who might end up coming. So the Facebook, the Twitter comments from people who are often not really qualified to give an opinion can be hugely influential and they can also be very destructive. They have to think about how they might display any new objects that they have. And this is something that Chawton has just bought, uh, a picture, a little miniature portrait of a woman called Mary Pearson, who was at one time engaged to Henry Austen. And they have also just recently managed to acquire a Jane Austen letter. So they've now got to make room for those things to be appropriately displayed. Do you take something down when you put this portrait up? You don't want the cottage to become too cluttered. And, and you've got to make sure that a tiny little miniature that somebody could just drop into their pocket by, uh, by accident um, you know, is properly protected. So there's all these things that the museums have to think about. 
and there's certainly a growing need to consider high security. A visitor to Doughty Street, the Dickens home, some years ago now, walked out with some very rare and valuable books. And this sort of sent shockwaves through small museums who thought they'd been pretty safe with their security and suddenly realised that they were no longer, need, you know, couldn't be as complacent as they had been. And this next picture shows the desk of the great French writer Honoré de Balzac. They used to have, sitting on the desk, which has been wonderfully worn away by his arm as he, he wrote dozens and dozens and screeds of novels, and all that writing has worn a groove in the wooden desk, which is quite fabulous to see. But they used to, on the desk, have a brass, I think it was, model of Balzac's writing hand. Somebody took it away with them. They sent out urgent pleas to the airports, would they all please look for a chunk of metal? And amazingly, they found it. Uh, and they stopped the, somebody who was trying to fly back to America taking Balzac's hand with him. So they were able to get it back, and of course it's now behind glass. And it's so much nicer to see it there on the desk where he did his writing, but of course, they're terrified that that might happen again. Uh, that's his lovely little home in Passy on the edge of Paris. Now, Jane Austen's topaz cross and the other cross belonging to Cassandra used to simply be under one sheet of glass. But such thefts have made museum staff much more aware of safety. And a special purpose-built safe that could display and protect the two crosses had to be constructed. And of course, it also had to be paid for. Glass is another issue in a writer's house museum. Now, the Austens, of course, would not have had their possessions in glass cases when they were alive. And modern visitors complain bitterly about glass because when you're trying to photograph something, you see yourself as photographer reflected back in the photograph that you take. And it can sometimes be much harder to closely look at items under reflective glass. So glass can be a barrier to us trying to experience an author in the flesh, which is what we want to do. So after COVID, will people be so used to sitting on their backsides at home and viewing things virtually that they may not want to go out and put time, effort and money into visiting a writer's house? What will the future of Chawton be in a post-COVID world? Does Jane Austen's house have a special aura? Or do we only feel that because we are so emotionally invested in her novels? After all, even I have to admit it's a very ordinary looking house. But oh, what works came out of it. Over my 20 years as a tour guide, I have literally visited hundreds of authors' homes. Some, even when I love the author, tend to leave me a bit cold. I think that Beatrix Potter's farmhouse is very pretty, it's packed with her things, it's an interesting place to visit, but I never feel anything in there when I visit Beatrix Potter's hilltop. I somehow don't have a real emotional connection in that house, whereas others in my tour group have felt deeply moved by their visit and listed it as one of the highlights of the tour. I have to say that Shakespeare's birthplace is not much fun to visit. Thousands of tourists are funneled through its passages. It's crowded, it's noisy, it's commercial, and again, I'm left cold by the visit. I tend to go and sit out in the courtyard where actors are performing scenes from his plays, and you can put in requests for favorite speeches, and that's much more fun than actually going into the birthplace. But other places, other writers' homes, have given me the most spiritual experiences I have ever had. Simply to sit by the fireplace in Coleridge's house and to picture him in that exact spot when he wrote Frost at Midnight is utterly wonderful. Bateman's, to visit and stand by Kipling's sundial, which is one of my favourite views in the entire world, and to look at his beloved home and his garden and imagine him walking there. To stand in Robert Louis Stevenson's home in Samoa and to hold in my hand his copy of Pride and Prejudice, which made me feel deeply connected with two favourite authors. To sit in Flaubert's chair, to enter Green Gables, to stand in Dove Cottage, to explore Mark Twain's Connecticut home, to walk over the Tamashanta Bridge that Robbie Burns wrote about. 
These and many, many, many more are the moments that have given me the glory and the dream. But more than any other literary place, it has been Chawton that moves me to the very core of my being. We could all still walk the gravel walk in Bath or stroll on the cob at Lyme Regis. We can visit the churches at Steventon and at Chawton. But without one forward-thinking woman named Dorothy, who showed vision and believed in the power of positive thinking, we would not have had this rather unprepossessing but oh, so important literary museum. So I'll end my talk by thanking Jane Austen for once living and writing in this cottage and by expressing my vast debt of gratitude to fabulous Dorothy Darnell for giving me and millions of other literary pilgrims the chance to visit this very sacred site. Thank you, everyone. I would just like to acknowledge a few things in the preparation of this talk. Uh, Emma Cleary did a wonderful YouTube talk, which you can watch. It's called The Jane Austen Society, founded 1940 from great, G-R-A-T-E, to greatness. So I got a lot of the information about the great and the early days of the society from Emma's fabulous talk. Uh, it was American scholar Janine Barkas who pointed out the Dunkirk connection when we recently did a Zoom discussion about uh, visiting Chawton Cottage. Uh, our American member, Collins Hemingway, gave me some interesting information about Mr. Carpenter and his work. And there's a fabulous book by Nicola Watson called The Author's Effects. My review of it will be going into December Sensibilities. Uh, and that raised a lot of really interesting ideas about why we visit writers' museums. So. I really hope that what I have done today is to make you think about places like Chawton.